Massively interactive live events as a bridge to the metaverse. I'll talk about uh, massively interactive live events, or what we call miles, and then I'll jump into case studies of um, CSGO, Rival Peak, and Pac-Man community. The concept that you'd watch people play games used to be limited to just sitting on your couch and waiting for the controller. Uh, today we're seeing as many people watch games as play them. How do we as game developers create content that maximizes um, the opportunity, not just for our own player base, but for also the people that are watching? And they want to engage, but maybe they don't have the time to engage uh, with all these games or with all these experiences. And so that's um, really what we've been thinking about when um, we've been thinking about the foundation of these massively interactive live events. Uh, the vision for Miles comes from 13 years of work of research uh, in the game streaming space by game, by game veterans from companies like Square Enix, Blizzard, Riot Games, Wargaming, and Rovio. Back in 2009, the people were, that I work with were thinking about games and the future of games and interactivity, and they had this thesis uh, that if you could render things in the cloud, you could do things with AI and physics that you couldn't do up to that point. Um, and they started to build prototypes and experiments. Uh, and at this time, you need to remember that Twitch didn't exist and that uh, live streaming was not supported by Facebook or YouTube. So what does this interactive media look like? Visual media, TV, and film started in the 1920s. Um, it became interactive with video games in the 1970s. Uh, game broadcasting in the early uh, 2010s. And the future of industry highly looks like um, very highly immersive ex experiences. Um, but there is an opportunity here between traditional media and fully immersive games that we think is compelling for video game developers today. A video game requires my full attention. I cannot play Angry Birds or Candy Crush or Clash Royale without uh, giving that game my full attention and tapping the screen. Traditional media doesn't require my attention. The average American watches five hours of television a day, but really they only give their full attention to maybe one hour of that, and that's usually some sort of premium TV show like Game of Thrones used to be, or maybe Better Call Saul now. Um, the other four hours, it's basically, um, I've got something else going on, maybe I'm cooking, maybe I'm doing something else in my apartment, I'm doing some work and my attention is kind of folding in and out of that experience. Um, there's an incredible amount of content out there being consumed by people that simply do not have the time to have that focus and they're not necessarily interested in getting progressively better at a game or they have the ability to get better at a game. Uh, and in my case, uh, if I wanna have a, a fully immersive several hour experience with a AAA game, maybe I just don't have that time but I can sort of stream that content and sort of vicariously experience it while I'm working on other things. Players are the core demographics that game developers are thinking about today, but when we look at streaming media and the streaming media wars between Netflix, Disney+, HBO Max, we see that there are billions of dollars being spent uh, on content today, and we see an opportunity for developers to create interactive experiences um, that can be consumed by linear media audiences. Has anybody here seen the, the Netflix uh, show Bandersnatch? Sort of a choose your own adventure thing. You could kind of select different sort of paths and outcomes. Now think about that if it were made by game developers. What sort of loops and engagements would be in that experience? You could still lean back and watch it like it were TV, but you could lean in and you could sort of touch things and interact with things that would impact that world. Um, and not just for you, but for everybody that was watching. People in traditional media don't really understand this, um, but game developers, particularly free-to-play uh, mobile developers, they know how to make these experiences successful. Uh, mobile developers that have worked with casual games, particularly genres like idle games, understand short, casual play sessions, and this is an opportunity to expand the audience beyond the players of the games to the people that watch the game, as well as the people that want to interact with them as well. So miles are cloud-powered, highly engaging, and interactive live broadcast events that allow anyone to be part of a large audience while directly participating in a meaningful way. They combine the best of lean-forward gaming, lean-back TV, and the thrill of live entertainment. Here, the audience will matter, and the individual can decide their own level of involvement or engagement. We think of this as a new form of content, a new genre of entertainment. If you want to immerse yourself and have agency, you can, but if you just want to lean back and watch it as TV, that's okay too. By allowing for these different levels of engagement, 
we're opening things up to create new audiences and create new revenue opportunities. Game studios are in a position to disrupt traditional broadcast experiences by creating content with increased interactivity uh, and a better viewing experience for a much lar larger audience. So when Pac-Man Community uh, launched on Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg called uh, Miles a bridge to the metaverse. And at GenVid, we've always been thinking about the future and really leaned into this idea about being a bridge to the metaverse. But honestly, there's a lot of noise about what the metaverse is, and it means different things for different people. So for us, the metaverse means a persistent world that could be potentially shared by millions of people, all in real time where they can make inputs and directly impact and shape that world collectively. It means accessibility. Miles are highly accessible. They don't require any skill. The mechanics are usually very casual. They load instantly. There's nothing to download, install, or update, so there's zero friction. Uh, in two of the case studies I'll discuss today, uh, they were launched as Facebook instant games. Uh, one was on Twitch, uh, but we're platform agnostic, uh, and we have other experiences that are on YouTube. It's like cloud gaming in that it is running remotely, but the video you're watching is not Stadia. It is not like one-to-one -one GPU. This is like a Twitch or a YouTube broadcast, which is being streamed one-to-many. Each stream is optimized for one spectator game instance in the cloud. The stream performs well on low-end devices that are otherwise difficult to support. Um, and the device just needs to play um, a YouTube clip in HD. As a result, we're able to reach huge audiences in countries like Brazil, India, uh, and Mexico. It's cross-platform. I can play it on Android, iOS, and desktop, but 90% of the users are on mobile. So on a practical level, how do we do this? People go to stadiums, or people watch TV, or they go to live events to enjoy a rich experience that they get from understanding uh, what they're watching, or music if it's a concert. And they want to go to the event knowing um, kind of what they're watching. And so um, these are kind of ways that we can add value, create enjoyment, um, and add competency and fandom. Um, one of the bigger problems in just watching streamers is I just get to see the player's perspective of what's going on. And if I don't play that game myself, I typically have no idea what I'm watching. Therefore, it's very sort of confusing for me and not particularly compelling. So if you look at the left here, bird's eye camera angles and maps that can be toggled off. Um, maps that would have real-time player data, and I'd actually be able to see how the players are coordinating and working together, allow me to see the tactics and the strategies that I wouldn't be able to see if I'm just watching a streamer. At the same time, I can pull up live statistics that help me follow my favorite player and compare my favorite player against other fan favorites or, or this type of thing as well. Um, so again, game developers are in a position to really make these experiences, not streamers. Um, but again, it's really important to give those, those, these audiences that big picture, that sort of understanding and, and agency and competency about what they're watching. Jumping to the middle, um, unlike sports, video games are in a state of constant flux. They are constantly evolving. We live in this world of live ops. Um, so it's important to tell the viewers what's going on so they understand what they're watching. This is super important to get novices in the game. But it's also uh, an interesting re-engagement mechanism because basically um, I might load a stream of a game that I used to play. It might be a huge um, 3x buff for ogres if it's an RPG game. I might have played this game from six months before. Um, and I have a powerful ogre from before. And now I'm kind of wondering what can my ogre do? Suddenly I'm leaving the stream and I'm jumping back into the game to play. And then finally, viewer interactions, which is where the viewer can reach out, touch the game, maybe throw a player a lifeline by giving them some extra health, or setting traps or somehow trolling them. So in 2018 and 2019, GenVid powered a number of Counter-Strike majors on Twitch. And this experience was highly interactive. Viewers could individually select from all 10 players. They could watch up to four streams, four player streams at once. Um, they could pull up real-time player statistics, participate in interactive cheering. And again, everything was rendered on the stream. Uh, no game engine required. Uh, it was the maps were highly customizable and you could toggle on and off the information that you wanted to watch and follow. And basically just whatever the individual's needs were. Uh, during these years, we worked with a number of R&D projects with various studios and Rival Peak was born out of a project made by Pipework Studios in Oregon. These guys made a very robust AI um, where they put 10 characters on this island and they were basically all trying to kill each other and they all had various needs and goals and they would kind of go and stain and they could collect different weapons and kind of go around and do things. And since we're working with all these watched experiences and audiences, they're like, do you have any ideas for us? What can we do? Uh, we partnered on this project. Um, and for the viewers, we created this drone system where you could launch drones in, they could contain medicine to help certain players, they could contain weapons so they would kill each other faster, or there might be a 
goat attached, a bomb attached to a goat that would kind of explode a, an area of people. Um, and this was just intriguing for Facebook and they picked it up and, and we worked together to evolve this in a, into a multi-million dollar project that was called Rival Peak. And so there were three parts to this mile of Rival Peak. The first was a Facebook instant game and this is the persistent world. Um, this part is very similar to the reality TV show Big Brother. There were a number of contestants, again AI characters, um, available 24-7, uh, a more advanced AI system from Pipework Studios. And the voting for all of this um, took place by letting the audience engage with these characters. Um, we called these audience participation events, or apes, and they were just various user interactions on the live stream, and I'll demo them in a minute. But at the end of the week, the AI character with the least number of votes or the least score was eliminated from the program. Rival Speak was the second component to this, uh, and it is a Facebook Watch original companion show, uh, and that hel helped us enter the world a little bit deeper. This section was more like watch, uh, Lost. It was a 30-minute program hosted by Will Wheaton. Um, conspiracy theories and total craziness came out, and it was just an opportunity to provide more background for everything. Um, but this was a crazy production schedule because essentially we had no idea, not the producers, not the developers, not the Will Wheaton, the host, who was going to get eliminated. So voting would stop on Friday and we would have the weekend to basically rewrite all the scripts and take the eliminated character out of the dialogues, um, script a program for Will, shoot him on Monday, post-production on Tuesday. Wednesday, we would actually air the program. The game would come offline and we'd be able to load the content for the next week um, into the mile. And then there was the Facebook uh, platform itself. Usually, back in the past, you'd be live tweeting, Game of Thrones, this is my reaction, all of this sort of stuff, but this was happening all right on Facebook's platform. And I'll just uh, click here to jump in. Famous last words, we'll see how this goes. And loads relatively quickly. Um, and you can see that I'm watching Winter here. She was one of my favorite characters. Um, um, and so basically right now she's at a point where she's trying to figure out what she's going to do next. So this is an opportunity for me to tell her what to do next. So there are three options that I can select from. Up here I can see kind of how she's doing in terms of what she needs for today and she's actually doing pretty well. Um, there's a daily vote that we can select. Uh, basically these are the kind of things that will either help drive the storyline forward and give the audience a sort of vo vo vote in the direction of where the storyline is going to go. Um, there's a home button uh, that I can go to, and again, this will load relatively quickly. And this is, this is cycling through all 12 characters uh, along the bottom. Um, you can see sort of my information here. We have achievements and leaderboards. It's available in eFigs or other couple things that we can configure. Um, these are just some cut scenes of um, things that separate the players and some pretty cool graphics and stuff that's going on. And then there's the opportunity to see um, all of the rival uh, peak, rival speak rather, um, episodes that are still here. Um, this was all running uh, sometime last year, um, and it's all available in rerun mode now. So if you want to experiment with it, you can. Um, and again, you can just kind of select any sort of character. And we're jumping to a separate live stream instance. Um, this is the video um, that's all sort of relatively high fidelity and then all these UI elements are basically an HTML5 layer on top of it that is powered by um, our tech. Close this. And this is just some emergency slides in case that didn't work. This is a, a copy of uh, Rival Speak um, with Will interviewing one of the AI characters. Um, and then some social um, Facebook um, shots of what was going on. Um, again, the project ran for 13 weeks. Uh, we had more than 100 million minutes uh, being watched. Um, again, these are the types of interactions that were available, which I just demoed. At the same time, it's interesting to point out that like voting wasn't the most popular thing to do here. Uh, we thought it was going to be really important to give people an opportunity to vote on everything. People were actually far more engaged with the daily dialogues as an asynchronous way to keep up with the storyline, and people got really involved in different events. Um, it turns out that voting, you have a lot of agency if there are only two people in your vote. You have a 50-50 chance that you're going to get your, your selection. 
You add another person, you're down to 33%. If you have thousands of users that are all voting for everything, you have very little agency in what's going on. Um, so we've been reworking this, and now we're working on a system that uses influence points, and you work on getting influence points by sort of grinding for them. Um, and then in a typical free-to-play model, uh, if I don't have time to play uh, or grind for influence points, I could buy influence points so that I could actually vote on things that really matter to me in terms of the design. Project power-ups, which are basically like idle games, Match three and memory games were sort of the audience participation events and ways that viewers could participate. They were all very light touch, casual games, very accessible. Um, and then we just added things like the achievements and leaderboards. Uh, we added tribute challenges because there were a lot of people that wanted to play match three all the time um, and basically use the whole storyline as a metagame for it. So basically people could just launch a, a match three game, play that, um, earn score, um, tools, food, or evil surprises could all get sent to the character of their choice, but they are earning points and then they are giving points um, to their characters so that they're not eliminated. Um, some basic demographics, the top five countries were the US, Mexico, Brazil, India, and the Philippines. Again, 13 Unity instances in the cloud that are streaming. Um, we only have to optimize for that instance in the cloud. Um, rendered very well on, on low-end devices, no need to optimize for them, and that's why we had such strong numbers in a lot of these countries. Um, I was sort of surprised that um, men edged out women in terms of this because it's very casual. At the same time, um, also surprised that so few people are using um, Facebook on PC. I'll add uh, the low number for, for iOS. Uh, is basically, iOS was not supported by Facebook until midway through the project. Uh, a lot of people were sort of asking for it, and uh, your voice matters. Uh, thanks. Um, power to the people. Pac-Man community um, is much smaller in scope and very similar to the type of projects that I'm working on with developers now. There's a um, QR code that maybe you can scan and you can kind of jump right into the game now. Actually, it was launched on December 6th, uh, collaboration with Bandai Namco, Facebook Gaming, and Genvid Entertainment. Um, and Mark Zuckerberg said at launch that you'll be able to play this classic game with friends, watch creators play, and build your own mazes. Gaming is a big part of the metaverse, and I'm looking forward to seeing games like this get more interactive and more immersive. Facebook gaming is bringing pillars of play, watch, connect together, which, which bridges playing games, watching gaming video, and connecting with others around games to create richer experiences between people and build community. And I think everybody knows Pac-Man, so I'm not going to bother showing it. Um, it's just kind of a four-player version that people can play. Um, but here's a quick peek at the maze creator. Uh, we exited beta recently on May 3rd. We have 17,000 mazes that have been created by users. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, just like showing that one off. Um, here's a screenshot of watch mode, which is basically an experience where hundreds of thousands of people are interacting with an AI Pac-Man that can boost either the Pac-Man or the ghosts. Um, eventually, players will be able to take over the AI um, and then drop in obstacles and interact with it in other ways. As more people interact with watch, um, they in turn lock, uh, unlock features for the maze creators. Uh, and the more mazes get created, the more features are getting unlocked in the watch section. Um, just here's a screenshot of an achievement uh, where the community has unlocked some stuff for the maze creators. Um, there's been a lot of engagement, and again, as far as being a bridge to the metaverse, it's about being immersive, creating interna inter interactive engagements that build community as well as accessibility. Again, everybody knows Pac-Man, so there's nothing to learn. It's a co-op game, and if, even if you're not that good, your friends can help you clear levels. Um, create and watch don't really require a skill. It's cross-platform, works on PC and mobile, basically any screen with an internet connection and an input. Um, it's run from a stream, so it's, uh, there's no sort of game engine required, works well on low-end devices, and it's all proven technology that works well today. Looking ahead, we're working with developers to make miles that will be featuring major established franchises spanning comic books, video games, TV, and film. Um, the Walking Dead Last Mile is due out later this summer. It will integrate a lot of the learnings from the created content from Pac-Man community, as well as modifying that mile voting system to be more of a bidding system using influence points. Um, and I'm working with independent studios on creating miles around existing games. I've got one team working on a cloud-based brawler, another team that's making a mobile uh, racing game that wants to have tournaments um, for players and viewers alike, similar to the CSGO majors. Um, and then a third game that's sort of a fun, casual MMO. And two of these games are actually mobile, and they really like the idea of reaching out to new audiences that are not on mobile devices, as well as creating sort of big screen events. Um, all these teams are working with their own publishers. We're just kind of collaborating in a way to share a lot of these learnings and, and um, everything. Uh, key takeaways, the audience watching live streams is growing faster than the games market. Um, it's an expanding blue ocean, according to a report from DFC Intelligence. Revenue is expected to grow to over $13 billion over the next few years. 
Um, we're platform agnostic, uh, so pick the platform that best reaches your audience, uh, be it Twitch, YouTube, or Facebook. Native cloud streaming reduces friction. There's absolutely nothing for the user to download, install, or update. Just jump right into the game. It's highly accessible. It works very well on low-end devices that are otherwise difficult to support and reach new markets. Just a little bit about the company as I close. Um, it was founded in 2016 by some Square Enix veterans. Um, they created Shinra Technologies, which is sort of Square Enix's um, cloud division, uh, computing division that was looking at new forms of gameplay. Um, it's a US-based startup. We've got offices around the world. We've raised $166 million to date. We have amazing advisors, like a former CEO from Square Enix, the marketing executive who was responsible for launching D Disney Plus, a woman who was instrumental in building Valve and Steam into what they are today, and she is head of studio at Bad Robot Games, working with JJ Abrams. Um, a guy from Twitch who has um, spent more than eight years in key roles at, uh, um, in partner and developer re relations, and then VP for original content uh, at Netflix. Uh, and I just mention all this because we've been around for a while, we've been thinking about this for a while, uh, and we're in this for the long haul. Um, with that, thank you. There's a QR code here. If you can scan it, um, there'll be a little survey. You can give me some feedback. I'm looking to get better at giving these talks. I'm always very nervous. Uh, sorry for that. Um, and then if you want uh, a copy of that executive brief on the, the DFC intelligence report, I'd be happy to share that. And with that, um, questions. Do you have any questions? 